Hi everyone, it's Lori here. I'm um, excited to talk to you about this week's lecture material. Um, so we're going this week we're going to be talking about the visual contributions to the control of gait. We're going to do a couple of case studies, um, sort of sprinkled throughout the uh, throughout the lecture. We're going to talk a little bit about the lesions of the dorsal and ventral visual streams. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some cerebellar and stroke patients and then some rehabilitation strategies using um, virtual reality. So pretty, hopefully a pretty exciting lecture this week. So before we get started, just a few quick announcements. Uh, first, a reminder that your oral presentation deadline is on April the 2nd, uh, so Thursday at 5 p.m. through that online course link video assessment tool. Uh, I believe this, the TAs have been fielding a few questions on that, but it seems to be working well. Please let us know if otherwise. Um, on the FAQ and the emails and the course announcement page last week, I um, indicated that the final exam is going to be changed from 40 to 30 percent, um, just to account for the fact that I know it's uh, stressful to write exams uh, during this time, and hopefully it'll give you a chance to put a little bit more work into that final group paper, um, and that will now be worth 25 percent, so up from 15 percent. Uh, a couple of questions that students have asked about the final exam. Um, I had a great meeting last week with some of the course link technical support. Uh, what I'm trying to do is not typically done on the final exam, so I needed to speak with somebody who has experience with doing this. Um, and it looks like it will work. My plan is to attempt to do that uh, this week with a like a practice final exam, just a few questions, just so that you guys could practice um, what that's going to feel like during the exam time. And it'll also be great because you'll just have some practice exam questions as well to, to work on. I'll post a regular word copy as well, but I just want you to experience the technology. Um, check that out at the end of this week. I'm putting a lot of effort into that. Uh, it is quite complex. I have to design macros and upload things. So the back end of that is actually really complicated. So that's where a lot of my energy is going, um, just because I want to make sure that that final exam is fair for you guys. So uh, take a look for that at the end of the week. I'm hoping I can um, get that practice exam up and running by then. It may not be perfect, but that's why they, but it's also a practice for me just to try out that software um, so we can work out the bugs next week too. All right, on to the lecture. So this slide is, um, I included this slide just to remind everybody a little bit about the neural anatomy behind uh, general visual processing. So I think you got a little bit of this in your anatomy class and a little bit of this in 3100 with Dr. Bent um, for those HK students. Um, for the bioengineering, biomedical engineering students, um, the main takeaway point of this message is that you have lots of different um, pathways going on with the visual um, processing. So you've got the left visual field and the right visual field. Left is in orange, right is in um, green. And what you'll see is that um, this information is coming in through both the temporal and the nasal um, uh, aspects of the visual system of the eyes. Um, this information gets crossed at the optic chiasma and um, that's really important because you can imagine if you have some type of uh, a lesion or perhaps a brain tumor, um, that type of thing right at that point, that's where you'll actually be missing information coming um, from both of the uh, nasal uh, perspectives. So that's what I would have talked a little bit about class. What's also really important um, in terms of relay areas within the cortex, you've got the lateral geniculate nucleus, um, where both information is coming in um, from the right visual field on the left side, and then on the right side, sort of opposite. So it crosses right over um, both at the, the different lateral, the left and the right lateral geniculate nucleus. And then you've also got the superior colliculus, which is a really important relay station as well um, for some of that initial processing of visual information. And then finally, this comes back to the primary visual cortex. This is not a neural anatomy class, so I won't get into too many more details, but just wanted to remind you to go back to take a look at some of those pathways um, if you need to. Um, how we're going to talk about it is more at the perception side. So in this slide I wanted to talk a little bit about the dorsal stream which occurs in the parietal cortex. In this image um, you'll see that this is actually um, noted by the green area of the brain. So that's the parietal cortex of the brain. And this information, this dorsal stream of the visual pathway, really tells us about an object's spatial location relative to the viewer. So um, think about this as a detailed map of your visual field. Um, so it allows us to also detect and to analyze movement. So it's a really important area um, to tell us about 
what's in front of us. Um, in contrast, you have the ventral stream, and this is going to be located in the temporal cortex of the brain. And this actually tells us information more about the object identification and recognition. So it stores that information um, within our brain. So um, both of these um, both of these areas are influenced uh, by extra retinal factors, like for example, attention. So how much attention are you paying to your surrounding environment? Um, how uh, good is your what's called working memory, which is going to be just that really short-term memory, think of it that way. Executive function, that's going to be located more in the frontal lobe, and that's going to be allowing you to do more comparison um, if you're trying to do judgments, that kind of thing. But all of these, the attention, the working memory, and executive function, those are all elements of cognitive processing, and that's really important in terms of what's significant in our visual world. So how are you actually directing your attention? It makes sense that vision and cognition are going to be uh, working together as we move through space. So um, think about, the way that I try to remember this is think about your dorsal stream of visual information. Um, it's relative to an object that's heading in your direction. So let's say you're playing baseball with friends in the backyard. Um, and somebody whips a baseball at you, um, you will, the dorsal stream as well, get um, activated to tell you, whoa, there's a baseball coming in my direction, so you sort of deke out of the way. Um, or perhaps you catch the baseball. The ventral stream will actually tell you that you're catching a baseball, and it's not a rock. So um, that's where the object identification comes in, that, uh, that purple area of the brain in this image. And you can find more information about this in this Goodall and Milner paper. It's a pretty, um, pretty pivotal paper, um, published in 92. So it's a classic. We're going to talk about, um, uh, in this particular paper, they really advocate for the fact that dorsal and ventral streams are separate. Uh, but I'm going to try to um, question that in the next few slides. So stay tuned for that in a second. OK, so I wanted to introduce you to this book by Oliver Sacks. Um, it's an older book now, but if you're looking for some interesting reading right now, um, I would really strongly recommend it. It's a group of short stories, and uh, the, sh the short story that uh, the title is pulled from describes a gentleman who's had a stroke, and the stroke occurred in the occipital temporal region on both sides. And this in for this individual, his ventral um, uh, visual stream, or that pathway, was affected. And remember that this ventral stream, uh, noted in purple on the brain in the right-hand corner of this slide, is really important for object identification and recognition. So um, for this gentleman, that uh, pathway was, um, there was a lesion and it was affected following that stroke. So as a result, he actually had visual agnosia. So what this meant was that he could see, but he couldn't put all the pieces together and recognize specific things. So, for example, he could see, this, see the shape of his wife's head, which was similar to the shape of the hat, but he could not tell the two apart. So if he showed an image of a hat and a head, he could not um, articulate that they were different uh, from each other. So imagine um, living your life like that. Uh, very unique and frustrating, I'm sure. Uh, another ventral lesion case study I wanted to share with you was a patient DF. Um, this was refer first reported back in 2003, but this woman um, suffered a bilateral damage along the ventral stream um, for visual um, processing, of course, is really important with that. She also experienced a form of visual agnosia. Um, she was able to actually control her actions with respect to objects, but she couldn't describe or recognize these objects verbally, which is very similar to the case um, on the previous slide for the gentleman who had the stroke. So what was interesting was that um, her accident didn't actually damage her parietal lobe, so it was the dorsal stream of processing um, that was actually left intact for this lady. There were some interesting studies that were done back in the 90s um, involving this woman. She was very gracious with her time um, because, as you can imagine, uh, this type of case study uh, permits some interesting analysis. So um, we, uh, we actually, as a group of researchers, have the opportunity to work with her. And I knew some colleagues of mine who actually um, worked with her on some of these experiments that I'll talk about now. So again, um, she developed this visual form of agnosia. She um, unfortunately had um, exposure to carbon monoxide 
um, poisoning or um, echinoxia. And um, one of the questions that they were curious about in this particular study that was published in 96 in Neural Report was about her sensitivity to obstacle height. So the researchers were just really curious about how the heck she got around the world, so how she was able to walk, because she was able to actually maneuver and walk independently um, quite successfully. So what they did was they presented her with a few um, different obstacles and they asked her to um, to move through the space and then actually to talk about how she moved about the space because they were curious about how she can articulate to that uh, articulate her strategies um, to the this research group. What was really interesting, the take home message is that this patient DF, she used obstacle negotiation patterns the same as controls when she was actually moving through the space. So her toe elevation actually increased linearly as a function of obstacle height. So they presented different obstacle heights to her, very low heights, um, obstacles with different slopes, different uh, higher obstacles, that type of thing. And she was always able to actively move through that space without tripping on that obstacle. What was really interesting, however, is that although despite the fact that she could actually move through the world without tripping, um, when they were asking her to make a verbal estimate of the height of the obstacle, she wasn't as accurate. So um, she was actually estimating, uh, un she was underestimating the height of those obstacles. So if she was to actually uh, put her foot up as high as what she would, um, uh, would actually lift her foot over the obstacle, it wouldn't be quite high enough, which was interesting. But yet she was able to move through the world, no problem. So that's an interesting um, phenomenon that she couldn't articulate it she couldn't even stand there quietly and lift her foot up off the ground to say ah, I'd lift my foot up about this high she would have always hit her foot on the obstacle had she lift her height her foot up at that height um, she wasn't quite getting it off the ground high enough for that particular obstacle but once again she could move through the world no problems so um, that was really interesting uh, that she could actually, her estimates of obstacle height were not accurate, but yet she could move through the world. So these results were really kind of groundbreaking and quite unique. As you can imagine, the opportunity to work with a patient um, like this was unique. And it suggests uh, to researchers that the cortical pathways that mediated um, the transformations for skilled actions um, to move through our world are actually separate from those um, that are providing um, perceptions of our visual world. And again, this was a pretty pivotal or a pretty classic paper um, from that time. Okay, I'd like to share with you a dorsal lesion case study. Um, and this was actually um, published in a review by Ziki in 91. So LM was a 43-year-old female. She was admitted in October of 1978 complaining of a headache and vertigo. She actually was diagnosed with a, with a thrombosis or blood clot of the superior sagittal sinus. And um, this is accompanied with bilateral symmetrical lesions in the posterior portion of the visual cortex. And this was actually confirmed uh, later with some newer imaging in 94 um, using PET and MRI imaging techniques. So this woman um, experienced motion blindness, which is a kinophysia. Uh, which means that she can't perceive motion in the visual field, but she can see stationary objects. So um, think about these things in terms of the object's spatial location. Um, she could actually um, determine uh, where that object was located in space. What was frustrating for this woman was that she had minimal motion perception. And um, so whenever she was, let's say, for example, crossing the street, she had to estimate the distance of moving vehicles by means of sound detection. So she couldn't actually detect um, that a car was moving or coming towards her. So other patients with similar lesions describe the sensation as objects appearing in one location and then another. Um, they have no sense of any movement occurring between those two direct those two locations. So it's almost like strobe lighting, if you can imagine um, what that would be like to move through the world underneath those um, circumstances. It must be incredibly challenging. So that's one example of a case where um, an individual has a dorsal lesion um, of, their, of their visual pathway. So up to this point I've really talked about and presented some case studies where we talk about dorsal and ventral lesions. 
Um, and again, I've mentioned in some of the Pat Law and Goodall papers, some of those classic papers, um, the visual pathways were often thought of as separate and not working together. And so I just wanted to make sure that we take a moment to really talk about the fact that um, there's been research, research, recent research that indicates that um, the independence of these two streams has been overemphasized and that uh, they don't actually work completely separately. The current thinking right now in the literature is that the dorsal stream is viewed as semi-autonomous. Um, so it operates under the guidance of executive functions. So remember those are your cognitive or your thinking skills. Um, which are which are then informed by the ventral stream processing. So, so it's actually that the two um, the two systems do connect and do actually work together. Um, I like this image. Um, perhaps this is actually what's happening within the brain. Um, so you can see that dorsal stream really important for planning, for motion and and attention. You've got the motor cortex, um, the arms and legs moving together as we move through the world. You've got the visual system, um, so that's where your eyes are actually looking at what's happening in the world. You've got the executive planning unit, um, so you're trying to make informed decisions and judgments about where you are in space. Um, down in the ventral stream, you've got um, looping in there, you've got images, and maybe you're reading words on a street sign, um, directions on a map, or maybe on your phone. You've got some routes that you may have pre-planned in your mind or in your memory that you've actually, I've walked along Wine Guard many times in the past. Um, and you've also got some image processing um, that's also occurring there as well in that ventral stream. And that the fact that it's probably that these streams are connecting together um, at different points in time within, um, within the within the actual uh, movement as we move through our world. So it's probably more complicated than what we, what we think by just sort of saying it's ventral, it's dorsal, it's, they are actually connected um, within the brain itself. Okay, so I've provided this image because I want, to think, I want you to think about how you might use vision um, to make your way across the stream. So um, if we were in class, I would be asking for input here, but this is where I would like you to think about all the different um, components that you must consider as you're, you're sort of making this root plan. So which stones appear to be stable to make sure that you're not going to go into this river. Um, you need to think about there's some that are wet, some that are dry, some that are moss covered. So you have to, you have to sort of make those judgments. Um, you then have to try to coordinate your your feet with your arms, maybe your arms are out for balance, those types of things. So this is actually a really complicated task. Um, you can imagine watching a small child or um, perhaps an individual, an elderly individual who's got some balance problems trying to do this. They may not even consider it. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's quite a challenging task. And this is, uh, I want you to keep this image in mind as we get to the next few slides when we talk about what is the role of vision and locomotion and how is it used um, by us to, to navigate through our world. So first off, um, the roles in locomotion, I try to summarize these to, to five um, big, big roles. So the first is detection of hazards. So if you're thinking about crossing that stream, uh, where are the Perhaps the rocks, maybe they're, they look a little bit uh, less stable, or maybe they're wet, or uh, they do have um, moss on them. Uh, you also need to use that information then to decide which maneuver to make. Maybe you're going to try to jump over one of those rocks that looks a little bit less stable. Then you can use that information to prepare for a maneuver. So perhaps you've got those arms out in front of you. Um, or you're going to plan on making a bigger push off if you're going to jump over something. Then you have to initiate the maneuver and then you might need to adjust. So um, perhaps your, um, your judgment was a little bit off and you didn't quite land on that, on that rock the way that you wanted. So then you need to quickly take up information and plan um, a compensatory movement to make sure that you don't get, um, get injured at that point in time or, or in the case of the crossing the river, um, end up in the river. So this is actually adapted from the James Tresillian textbook, um, which I really love. Uh, it's a great, it's a great, uh, a great resource. And uh, again, if you keep going in this area in the future, you might want to take a look at, at that as a, it's a great source of information about how we actually use sensory information um, to move through our world.
So in terms of strategies that we use to maintain dynamic equilibrium, we can think about this in terms of proactive control and reactive control. And I've tried to set this slide up in a similar way as how I set it up for postural control. So now it's, it's hopefully familiar to you. We're just now talking about locomotion. So as we move through the world versus um, quietly standing and making sure that we're balanced during, uh, during a quiet stance um, maneuver. So in terms of the proactive control side, I want you to think about the fact that we actually have visually based and experience guided information. So we can actually use vision um, to look ahead across that river to say, oh, this rock looks a little bit unstable or it's got moss covered. So that potentially could cause me to go, I could slip on that. So you're going to use that, um, that vision and the experience perhaps that you might have had last summer when you tried to cross that river um, and you said, oh gee, I, I misstepped on that stone and I actually fell in. So that's the experience piece. And it couldn't, maybe it doesn't necessarily be, have to be the exact same experience, but something that's similar um, that you can rely on. So you know, okay, I've got to change my behavior here. And how do you actually change the behavior? So you can actually adapt your responses to avoid those potential perturbations that you're visually um, visual system and your experience, your past experience has provided to you. So you might, for example, select alternate foot placements. You could maybe avoid an obstacle in your environment by increasing your limb elevation, so hiking that foot up. Or maybe you duck your head, uh, or you steer around something. Or maybe if it's, a, if it's a severe perturbation, you might just stop your walking altogether. And that might be just to let somebody um, go around you, um, that kind of situation. In the middle, if you remember, we had this um, for our postural control strategy as well. You have somewhere in the middle between proactive control and reactive control, you have predictions of expected perturbations. So you're pretty sure that you may experience some type of um, perturbation here. And this is absolutely based on past experience. Um, and this might be generated due to ongoing movements or maybe it's concurrent. Um, so other voluntary movements that you're um, that you're actually producing at the same time. And so you're predicting that you might be, um, that you might experience a perturbation. So in those situations, you can actually elicit a stabilization response um, prior to having that expected perturbation. So a stabilizing response um, then could be that you're gonna stiffen up those muscles. Um, you're going to put those arms out to the side. Uh, maybe you're going to move a little bit slower, for example. So all of these are examples of stabilizing um, responses that are going to be initiated prior to actually experiencing that um, perturbation, just because you expect it may um, knock you off your feet. And finally, in the last column, this is where you're responding to some type of perturbation in your environment. So you're going to use your sensory information, um, perhaps vision, vestibular, somatosensory, everything that's going to tell you you're going to be re reacting to um, the fact that you've lost your balance for a moment. And these stabilization responses following an unexpected perturbation might be um, passive muscle tissue properties, so you're going to somehow have to um, exhibit, uh, you know, stiffening of the strategies. You may have to um, flex and extend different muscles to make sure that you're going to cap catch yourself from falling and injuring yourself. Um, you can also um, modulate and gate reflexes. So um, gating of your reflexes just mean that you're going to tune them up or turn them down. So you're just going to um, amplify or um, enhance or actually inhibit some of those reflexes. There, there's a point you can't completely um, negate these reflexes, but, um, but they will be really important to responding to these reactive control situations. Um, you have something called stored trigger responses. These are again based on previous experiences. Um, so these might be stepping responses that we've talked about in class, like one or two steps to regain your balance. If you experience some type of a perturbation of the support surface. And it could also be voluntary responses. So it could be you reaching out to grasp a handrail, for example, um, if you're falling down um, a set of stairs or that type of a scenario. So these are all different types of stabilization responses that you could elicit following an unexpected perturbation. Um, so how do we actually uh, how do we actually move through the world? Um, that's really important I think in terms of how we're going to take in the sensory information. So there's three frames of reference that um, uh, are really critical for how we move um, during uh, walking. 
The first is kinesthetic input. So think about this really as primarily driven by proprioceptive information. So this is a sense and position of our movement, um, one body part relative to another. Um, then we have um, uh, visual, kinesthetic, and vestibular input. So we term this exproprioception. And um, for now, I'm going to call this egocentric, uh, egocentric reference frames. So it's going to provide information about the position and movement of the part of the body that's going to be relative to the external environment. Finally, we have visual input. So visual input is the only sensory system that we have, which will provide information about um, objects in the external environment relative to one another. So we call this extraception um, or allocentric reference frames. So again, if you think about this, your visual system is the only one where you can look at an object in the environment and determine distances, judge distances, for example. Um, so time of contact, those types of things. Our vestibular system it really detects accelerations of the head. Um, our proprioception um, will tell us information about body position um, with one segment relative to another, but vision is the only thing that can tell us information about um, external objects in our environment. So um, in the literature you'll often see these terms which I've highlighted here, proprioception, egocentric, and allocentric. Those are the more common terms. Um, and so I'm going to use those in the next slides moving forward. Okay, so what is an allocentric versus an egocentric frame of reference? So, um, as I mentioned before, when people navigate through their environments, there's a representation of their physical location is, that's formed, and we constantly update this. So as we're walking through the world, we know that we're getting closer to perhaps our final uh, destination or our end goal. Maybe that's a, a location on campus or something like that. So the allocentric or envir environment reference frame is centered on an external point in the environment versus our egocentric reference frame is really centered on the navigator, so the person actually moving through the space. So I've included a couple of images here. So an allocentric would be object to object reference frames. So in this particular scenario, you've got um, the avatar here, the individual that's standing and looking at three objects in, the, um, in their world. So there's a bicycle, a fire hydrant, and a um, pickup truck. And they're trying to judge distances, and right now, they're really encoding information about the location of one object and its parts with respect to the other. So it could be the bike with respect to the fire hydrant, and then the fire hydrant with respect to the pickup truck. Um, this is in contrast to an egocentric reference frame, um, or self to object, which is going to represent those distances um, or the location of objects in space relative to the person um, themselves. So it's going to be the person to the bike, person to the fire hydrant, person to the pickup truck. And what's really interesting is as we move through the world, we don't really think about it, but we actually update both our allocentric and egocentric reference frames simultaneously all the time. Um, it kind of blows your mind. Next time you go for a walk, um, think about this. Um, it's not like you're saying allocentric, egocentric. You just constantly update um, that information as you're moving through the world. And this is something that's been practiced and developed since you were a small child. Um, there was an interesting study that was looking at the role of vision. So I wanted to bring you back to um, these ideas of extraceptive and expropriaceptive um, information. So again, extraceptive is going to tell us information about terrain layouts and surface and obstacle characteristics. And expropriaceptive is going to tell us about um, what is our orientation or our body configuration or perhaps movement of our body segments with respect to the environment. So there was a really cool study that was done a few years ago now by a colleague, um, Shirley Reedike, who's down at Purdue University in the States. And she was very curious about the interplay between extraceptive and expropriaceptive visual information. So how do we take in information about um, our objects in our environment and use that um, to actually guide our movements of our body segments within that environment as we move real time through space? So um, what the question that she was looking to answer for this particular study um, was regarding obstacle clearance. So we know from past research that lead limb, uh, so that's the limb that's leading over top of an obstacle when we step over an obstacle in our environment, it's controlled by visual information. But the question that she had was, is seeing the obstacle enough information? Or do we have to know the relationship of where our foot is um, relative to that obstacle 
to be able to successfully step over something in our environment. So not just seeing that obstacle, but seeing our foot in relation to the obstacle. Um, and uh, it was a really cool question, I think. So the purpose of the study was to determine how visual extraceptive information um, about the obstacle, so for example, in this particular study, it was the obstacle height, um, modified foot placement and foot elevation, so how high they lifted their foot up off the ground, um, with and without information about where that foot was in space, so without absence, um, in absence of that proprioceptive information about that foot in space. So the first two examples in A and B here, you can imagine the person was walking through the world, they had this obstacle laid down on the travel path in front of them, their task was to walk and step over this obstacle, and they had two vertical posts that were attached to the obstacle that would just make sure that the person didn't um, sort of veer off the path. And um, uh, so it just sort of tells them where along the travel path those, that obstacle was located. They also had off to the side, you can see this in, in part B here, an obstacle that was the exact same height as the obstacle they had to step over, but it was just oriented in a different, um, in a different way. So instead of across the travel path, it was just um, perpendicular to the travel path, but the same height, same characteristics um, of, this, of this obstacle. And the obstacle was normalized um, to, I believe it was 10% of the lower uh, the lower limb. So it was normalized for every person. It was sort of relative to their own limb length. So that was part A and part B, or those two conditions. They also had, um, sorry, and that's in green there, I forgot to mention. So that was that external object there located 90 degrees. Um, they also had a couple of uh, two other experimental conditions where they asked the individuals to wear these basketball training goggles. So um, the goal of this, if you've ever played basketball, maybe your coach made you wear these, um, they block your lower visual field. So you can no longer see where your foot is in space. Really helpful for basketball players because it just trains them to use their feeling of that ball and to really ga uh, make sure that their gaze is um, elsewhere on the court and not just down on where their hand is contacting the ball. So um, what they did was they used those goggles to then restrict visual information about their world. So um, I just sort of highlighted this in a, in a bit of a deeper color gray here. Um, but you'll see that the obstacle now uh, was no longer um, visible within the sight line of that, of that participant as they walked over it. Now they still knew where the obstacle was because of those vertical um, uh, projections of that obstacle. So they weren't it wasn't like they couldn't judge like the distance from the starting point, um, but they just didn't know how high the obstacle was and, more importantly, where their foot was in relation to it um, specifically. They also then um, had that condition where they included that um, the exact same obstacle, just uh, uh, like a second version of it, if you will, located 90 degrees to that travel path, so they could look um, in advance or just past the obstacle to say, oh, that's where that obstacle is, that's how high it is um, within, the, within that travel space. Okay, what did they find in this study? So the big take-home message was they found that wearing those basketball goggles actually resulted in increased horizontal distance. So that was the distance between the foot and the obstacle along the travel path. They also saw an increase in toe clearance, so they really hiked that foot up off the ground. And they were also really variable with that toe clearance. Um, but the obstacle height cue, so that's where I tried to outline that in green, that didn't actually alter any of these measures. So having that additional information um, a little bit further down the travel path, it, wasn't, it didn't really inform people um, at all in terms of how they got that foot over top of the obstacle. So what was really interesting and um, a great contribution of this article, um, so the big take-home point, is that it really showed that visual expropriaceptive information um, was important. So remember that expropriaceptive information in blue here will provide information about the orientation of motion of your body as you're moving through space relative to the objects in your world. So that's really important um, when we're stepping over obstacles. It's not just enough to know um, the surface or obstacle characteristics. Um, where it is on the travel path or how high it is. You really need to see your foot moving over top of that obstacle in order to make um, sort of good judgments. The individuals were able to, um, to do this task. It, they just saw more um, conservative strategy, so they just really hiked over that foot just to make sure that they were safe.
So it was a really cool study, um, and it was published in Neuroscience Letters 2007. I gave a citation there if you want to read further into that study. Okay, just continuing on with this idea of visual perception and extraceptive and expropriate-specific or proprioceptive information. Um, they're used simultaneously in the literature, expropriate-specific and expropriation. Um, and I want to talk then about a little bit further about, um, about how this is used. So how do we actually sample um, traits of the environment? So we can actually use a spatial temporal um, uh, way of looking at our visual information. So we can look at the number, the duration, and the patterns of visual samples. Um, you can look at static versus dynamic cues. So this could be if you're stopped and you look at an object and say, yeah, I can get over top of that. Or dynamically, as you're moving through space, you make that judgment call as you're actually walking. Um, and you can also scan a region and plan for gate adaptation. So if there's a hole in the travel path, like maybe um, like a, a pothole or, or some type of a road work that's in front of you, you may look at the inner and outer boundaries of that space to make sure that you're successfully going to avoid it. Um, and of course, this is going to require attention. So I want to make sure that that's that that's present. The role of cognitive attention or thinking as we move through the world is really important. Um, in terms of locomotor adaptive strategies um, that are based on our visual perceptions of the world, again we can use different avoidance strategies. These could involve things like increase that limb elevation, which is what we, we saw in um, the previous study that we talked about with the basketball goggles. You could lower your head. You may have to make a direction change. You can choose alternate foot placements, so stepping wide to get around something, or once again, you can stop in extreme cases, just arrest your movement altogether. Um, you can also accommodate the, the environment, so perhaps you just slow down, so you decrease that velocity or speed up. Um, you can change the limb orientation. You can change your foot contact velocity. Last week we talked about this work um, with regards to those rollers that were, that were locked or unlocked and how important that was in terms of slips. So you could really slow down that foot contact so that you don't have, you're lowering your chance of slipping if it's a, if it's a slippery surface. Um, you can think about the locus of propulsive power. Last week again, we talked a little bit about how this is affected in Parkinson's disease. Um, but uh, you could also just reduce that push off um, force coming from the ankles or maybe from the, from the hip. Um, and you can also change your pattern of limb support. So you can spend more time on one limb versus another, or perhaps uh, increase the percentage of double support phase um, during the gait cycle if that's required to accommodate um, something that's in your travel path. So what are the factors that influence successful mobility? Um, I want you to think about this again in class. This is going to be a little bit of a breakout activity. So I want you to think about skills and the abilities of the performer requirements of the task or the activity and the challenges of your environment. So if you remember way back from the very beginning we talked about individual task and environment um, and I want to get back to some of those ideas here. So if we think about the skills and the abilities of the performer, um, think about an advanced versus a novice tennis player and how they're actually moving through the court. Um, think about a toddler versus an 18-year-old young adult um, that's on a nature hike crossing that stream that we saw a picture of uh, a little while ago. Um, what types of um, skills do they need to be able to successfully navigate that environment? I want you to also think about requirements of the task or the activities. So um, what about if you're late for class? Well, you might be walking as quickly as you can um, to try to get there. So sometimes mobility is affected by that. So you couldn't use some of those strategies we talked about in the last slide about um, reducing that contact velocity if you're booking it across campus. Um, but you, what about other situations like, um, for example, an oncoming vehicle? Or you have to make a sudden change in travel direction. You maybe just weren't paying attention, and now you've got to quickly change um, your travel path. Uh, and also, finally, um, challenges of the environment. So what about if you're hiking on a narrow path of a sheer cliff? Um, maybe you're going to take small steps um, just to make sure that you're safe. Or what about if you're walking on a slippery, upward-sloping sidewalk? Um, perhaps you're going to slow down or, or maybe grab for that handrail. So the environment will absolutely affect um, the successful mobility. So think about those things again as you're moving through the world, maybe going on a, a hike yourself to get some fresh air um, in the next week or so. Um, think about these types of things that actually influence your successful mobility as you move through the world.